John Hick is the most well-known and, and widely read proponent of the view of religious pluralism. And in part one here, we'll explore the background of why he takes the belief that he does regarding pluralism, consider at least one objection, and then how he responds to that. In part two, we'll consider some more significant challenges to Hick's view on pluralism and how he might respond to those as well. Now, if you are really impatient and you want to jump ahead to kind of bottom line what its view is, you can fast forward up to slide number six, but there is important information here giving you more rationale, more background to fully understand what he is up to in the slides before then. So first what Hick does is he asks this question or addresses this question, what is religion? And Hick has a response that's quoted here. So he says, religion is an understanding of the universe together with an appropriate way of living within it, which involves reference beyond the natural world to God or gods or to the absolute or to a transcendent order or process. Now, we've seen definitions of religions before. We've talked about how it is very difficult to define religion. The authors of the textbook Reason and Religious Belief, that is uh, Michael Peterson, William Haskard, Bruce Reichenbach, and David Basinger, have a definition uh, from their fifth edition, I'm just quoting on, from page seven there, where they say religion is constituted by a set of beliefs, actions, and experiences, both personal and collective, organized around a concept of an ultimate reality that inspires or requires devotion, worship, or a focused life orientation. And this is a, a well thought through definition, the four of them. I have obviously worked on this over the years. It has changed through uh, the various editions that they've written with that text, Reason and Religious Belief. So we've used that definition in the past. It's a, it's a pretty good definition. Like all definitions of religion, it's going to be flawed. But you can see some of the contrast there with Hick and with the authors of the textbook, Reason and Religious Belief. And Hick explicitly includes reference to God or gods but he also includes or to the absolute or a transcendent order. So he, he, he does cover some broad areas. What he doesn't do is talk about this uh, inspiration or requiring of devotion and worship uh, that the authors of the text do. Now, what Hick does is he goes through some significant, what he calls at least religious history. And for Hick around 2000 BC, uh, religions first took shape, that is, they became structured in the two major civilizations at that time, in Mesopotamia and in the Indus Valley. And in Mesopotamia, they pre predominantly had male deities only. And in the Indus Valley, they also included female deities that would hold a prominent place. Now, Hick calls these developments natural religion. He claims that they appeared without the intrusions of divine revelation or illumination. In other words, he says during this period, it's humans creating their own ideas, humans coming up with the ideas of the gods, how to worship them, and so on. It's human originated. Now that changes, according to Hick, when we get to what he calls the golden age of religious creativity. And this occurs around 800 BC when written religious revelation and revelatory experiences become more prominent. And according to Hick, then the divine presence began to intervene with humans the divine presence began to inspire revelation, writings, practices, and so on. So he, he gives several examples of these. The Jewish prophets, for example, uh, the major prophet Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea. So you have that history in that tradition. We have Zoroaster and Pers Persia, 
um, with the a good God and a principle of evil that's almost equivalent with God. There is a heaven and a hell, a judgment and a resurrection where you face judgment. And so we have this life after death concept there, as well as the strong forces of good and evil. In Lao Tzu and Confucius in China, primarily their values are wisdom in affairs of the world. They value humility and loyalty, virtues such as those. Uh, a, a couple examples here of the statements of Confucius, flattering lips seldom speak of love. And do not grieve that you are not well known. Grieve that you do not know others. I especially like that one. I think that's a very nice statement there. But we go on. There are other examples. There are other moments of divine revelation. Uh, the writings of the Upanishads in India is occurring around that time, around 800 BC. We have Gautama Buddha uh, lived somewhat close to that time, the Mahavira, the founder of the Jain religions, the ascetic religions, where it's a call on people to conquer their desires and have this primary focus of do no harm. We have the Bhagavad Gita, which is being written, uh, lots of insights there. And in philosophy, we have some aspects of religious inspiration, according to Hick, with Pythagoras, with Socrates and with Plato in Greece. So we have this variety of, of inspiration from this golden age of creativity, of divine revelation, according to Hick. Okay, so what's Hick's rationale behind pluralism? Well, obviously that history that we just talked about is very significant here. And Hick asked this question, is it more reasonable to think that God would make his revelation known in a single mighty act or in partial revelations in a variety of places? And obviously Hick thinks the latter is much more reasonable, that God would do his best, so to speak, to reveal himself as much as possible with the wide variety of peoples and cultures that exist. So uh, Hick clearly comes down with the latter, that God does this in partial revelations at various places. So at the time that the divine presence was revealing itself, Hick argues it could not have done so through human means to all humans, right? Because the world wasn't set up like that any then at that time. There's a fragmentation of cultures. Uh, that separates people and the ideas that they have. In addition, each of the major religious complexes has expanded, according to Hick, until contacting another major religion. And then there's this somewhat of a stable equilibrium. So this spread of the major world religions occurs geographically, and then you have this expansion, and then you have somewhat of a stability. Now, obviously, into the 21st century here as we are, that is getting less and less the case as, of course, all kinds of religions are growing in various parts of the world. So Islam is certainly spread far from the Middle East. So Christianity is spread through all the continents. For example, Buddhism is spread through all the continents and so on. And so there is quite a, a bit more mixing than Hick talks about in his initial discussion here. Okay, what is the thesis of Hick? What are we calling pluralism? Well, he says, look, the main religious movements, those in the Judaic Christian tradition, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, his thesis is they are not essentially rivals. Instead, they began at different times and places and expanded and then stabilized in the way that we've just described. And you have this great variety of cultures that required different aspects of revelation. So some cultures were more amenable to certain kinds of revelation than others. 
And that explains the differences among the world religions. So these are not created by humans, originated by humans, as Hicks said, of the time frame around 2000 BC. Instead, these are divine revelations, but they had to be suitable to the culture to which was being revealed. So what is a challenge to this view? The first challenge we are going to consider is that there certainly are conflicting truth claims of the various religions. So let's just consider a few, and sometimes uh, we'll just consider these as questions, and they're just representative. So for example, is the divine nature personal or impersonal? And you have different answers to that questions from different major religions. Does deity become incarnate? Again, different responses according to different religions. Is the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible or something else, the word of God? Obviously, you have different answers according to different religions. Do the claims of Christianity imply that Hinduism is false? Obviously, this is a, a tension there. Do the claims of Buddhism imply that Islam is false? We have these questions and challenges that seem to be indicative of the kinds of very different truth claims that there are among the major world religions. So how does this all fit together? How can they all be the result of the revelation of one divine being if you have such important and significant contrasting views of what the divine nature is. Now, Hick responds to this challenge. He was, he's well aware of this kind of challenge, and he claims that the ultimate divine reality, call that the nuominal, right, the thing in itself, is infinite. It is generally accepted that that's the case, okay? And because of that, it transcends the grasp of the human mind. Uh, we are just finite minds, so we cannot grasp the infinite. And this is accepted to certain extents in some religions, but it's qualified usually. And clearly, some of the claims, as indicated on the previous slide, these challenging questions, are things that the religions say, think clearly that humans can comprehend and we can get a grip on the infinite to a certain extent. But Hick claims that God cannot be grasped and cannot be defined. And so what he does is he argues that the various encounters with the divine, the phenomenal subjective encounters as experienced and then as expressed in the various religions, may all be encounters with one infinite reality. And so he is very fond of the analogy, the blind man and the elephant. So we talked through this analogy previously, but just a brief summary, right? You have four or five blind men and they approach an elephant and each of them comes into contact with different aspects of the elephant. So one, a leg and says, the elephant is like a tree. One, the side and says, the elephant is like a great wall. One, the tusk and says, the elephant is like a, a plow. One, the, the tail and says, the elephant's like a little snake. And one, the trunk maybe, and says the elephant, no, it's like a very large snake. And so you have these different views of the elephant, whereas Hick says, look, that's kind of what's going on with the divine reality. It reveals itself in different ways to different cultures at different times. So yeah, something cannot be both shaped like a tree and like a wall and like a snake and like a plow or all of those things, right? Um, yeah, sure, that's true. But the experiences of those blind men who described it that way were, were revealed by the nature of the elephant. 
And so uh, the encounters have grossly distorted the accounts of the divine because of their partiality. So the moral of the story then is not that any and every conception of God or the transcendent is valid, but rather that every conception of God or the transcendent that has come out of a great revelatory religious experience and has been tested with a long tradition of worship, those represent a genuine encounter with reality. So this analogy, the blind man and the elephant, is very crucial for Hick. He takes that very seriously as an analogy of the divine nature revealing itself to us. We are like the blind men. The various religious traditions are like the blind men, so they have distorted views of that divine nature. So the encounters of the major religions, let's just make this very explicit, are encounters of the same divine reality, but they come from different historical and cultural standpoints. And it's because of that that they vary greatly, not because of the divine nature. So that's Hick's view of pluralism and how he responds to that concern of conflicting truth claims. In part two, we're going to consider some other challenges to his view and how he might respond to those.